So, um, so E2211 is a randomized phase two study that's done through the ECOG Akron National Clinical Trial Network. And it was designed because there are not many agents that yield tumor shrinkage um, for patients with advanced pancreatic, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. The only cytotoxic chemotherapy that's approved for this disease is streptozocin. It's an IV chemotherapy associated with a fair number of side effects. And temozolomide is an oral alkylating agent, so in the same class as streptozocin, and it has clear advantages over streptozocin, including fewer side effects, it can cross the blood-brain barrier, um, it's oral, so it's just, it's quite a bit more practical for patients. Over the years preceding the development of the study, there had been some small prospective and retrospective studies using capecitabine and temozolomide that, um, that suggested really high response rates. And so we based this study on that. Um, so it's a study of cape cytobine temozolomide versus temozolomide alone. We used temozolomide alone as the control arm because there was great interest. We figured both arms would actually provide us with really useful information um, because this was felt to be a really active agent. Yes, so the eligibility criteria were patients with low and intermediate grade advanced pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Um, patients were stratified by having had either prior, prior eberolimus, prior sunitinib, which are both FDA-approved agents in the disease, or concurrent somatostatin analog. And they were randomized one-to-one. -one. Um, it was 144 patient studies, so 72 on each arm, to either temozolomide as a single agent. That was dosed at 200 milligrams per, per meter squared days one through five, so only five days out of a 28-day cycle, versus capecitabine and temozolomide together. So capecitabine was dosed at 750 milligrams per meter squared BID for two weeks, and then the temozolomide came in at days 10 through 14 out of that two-week period, also a 28-day cycle. Patients could receive a max of 13 cycles for the, for the study, and the primary endpoint was progression-free survival by local review. Secondary endpoints were response rate, overall survival, and toxicity. And then the other important thing that we reported out um, that this study was uh, were correlative analyses, so central path review we did after the study was completed, and then looked at methylguanine methyltransferase, which is a DNA repair enzyme that in glioblastoma is a predictive marker for response to temozolomide. So we looked at that by two methodologies, immunohistochemistry and promoter methylation. So we found, um, and we had previously presented the interim analysis data in 2018. So that data, um, where the, the, we met the primary endpoint of progression-free survival, um, the Cape cytobine temozolomide combination arm had a longer PFS of about 22 months versus 14 months. So it was about an eight-month absolute difference favoring the combination arm. The hazard ratio was 0.59 with a statistically significant p-value. So what was updated was the overall survival. So we found that, that was, there was no statistically significant difference in OS, um, likely due to the fact the median OSs were in the like 53 to 58 month time frame. So actually those are the longest um, median overall survivals reported in any prospective study for advanced peanuts. There was a five month absolute difference. So I think that's a clinically meaningful difference but it did not need statistical significance. And, this is a real challenge in neuroendocrine tumor studies um, for patients with grade one or two low grade neuroendocrine tumors. And the, likely it's because patients go on to get many other therapies after they go off. So patients could get a year of treatment and they had you know, an overall survival that extended to four or four and a half years. Um, the other data that we presented were on MGMT, and so we found that MGMT was associated with response. Um, and MGMT, this study was not designed to look at MGMT as a predictive biomarker because both arms contain temozolomide. So in GBM, we know that it's predictive to respond. Uh, uh, predictive of response to temozolomide. However, we had no non-temozolomide containing arm, but we did see that it was clearly associated with response by both methodologies, by both IHC and promoter methylation. But then when we looked at the patients that had both tests, so there were 55 patients that had both IHC and promoter methylation, we found that all of the patients who were promoter methylation positive were also IHC positive, but the reverse was not true. So the large majority of patients had, you know, were IHC positive. And so what that likely indicates is that promoter methylation is probably not sufficient as a biomarker 
for pancreatic nets, and there are likely other mechanisms for downregulating down MGMT other than just methylation. Yep. So I think um, Cape Tem has really since 2018 become more commonly used for advanced pancreatic nets. It really belongs as a standard treatment in guidelines. I think it, it's listed in some of the guidelines, but I think this hopefully will strengthen that data. Um, and then I think in terms of MGMT, um, it is probably not recommended for routine use, but for patients that need an objective response, I think that that subset of patients we can consider doing MGMT testing. And then confirmatory testing is really needed in future studies. We already are seeing Cape Tem used as a comparator arm in a number of ongoing studies, and we'll have the opportunity, hopefully, to look at that and answer that question.